Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you that you are with us, but that we recognize you, that your people recognize you. We thank you, Lord, that our eyes are opened. You said, he who has an ear, let him hear. Well, I thank you that we have ears to hear. That we see, we hear, we recognize our Savior. We recognize our Lord. Praise you, Lord. I thank you for tonight. The eyes are open. Revelation manifests. Miracles manifest. Thank you, Lord. We give you all control over this. Say whatever you want. Do whatever you want, Lord. Holy Spirit, this service is yours. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Our worship team is amazing. Thanks, Chet. You know, <clears throat> you guys can stay up if you want to. I, it doesn't matter to me, but I like that. Um, pastor was talking about, and I have a feeling I'm not even going to do what my message was. <laughs> pastor was talking about changes of seasons, and that resonated in me the minute he said it, that the season's changing. And um, it just something went off in me. And when you look at changes in seasons in the Bible. Um, you look at the people who were key players. A lot of the people that we that we celebrate in the in you know everyone knows that there's you know there's 66 books of the Bible, right? There's there's people like Amos that not a lot of people might read them, but everyone knows who Daniel is. Everyone knows who David is. Everyone knows these kind of people. And I think that was because it was at a changing point. I think that if you look at the key people, it was during a point of change. That when all of the people went one way, these people went the other. When the whole world was gripped with fear, they weren't. That was the difference. So you look at someone like Noah, when the whole world is oblivious and he's preparing. You look at someone like Moses, who when everyone has accepted their circumstances, he says no. Same with Daniel. Same with David, right? All of a sudden, we start shifting into this, um, a monarchy. We sh start shifting into this kingdom. And David stands up and is a bold man of righteousness that says, whatever the Lord says, we can do. That's the difference, right? All of a sudden, there's a shift again. And when John the Baptist comes on the scene, prepares the way for the Lord. Jesus leaves. Now you've got the disciples. And I think pastor is absolutely right. I think there's a shift. I think we all feel that. I think we all knew it was coming and we all felt it. I think the world and the church has felt it, to be honest with you. I don't think that that's necessarily exclusive to the church that they felt that. It's just that we know what it is. And... Um, What's the Bible going to say about us? You know? Yeah. What is it going to say about us? Did we stand? Are we part of the multitudes that, that, that murmured, complained, were in fear? Or are we, the one, are we, are we going to be the Moses? Are we going to be the Daniel that says no? It was always a remnant. It's always a remnant. Right? Sometimes it was for multiple different reasons. You go back to... Um, um, and if you want to sit, sit, you guys go ahead and sit. That's, that's fine. Um, I don't want you to feel obligated to stand. If you want to stand, you can stand. Um, and so you look back into um, um, Daniel is the one that jumps out at me the most when Pastor said that. That was the one that really hit my heart the hardest. Um, and in Daniel, you see this... Um, um, and you guys are good anytime. I, I know. You guys are, thank you so much. 
I don't want you guys to be like, do we stop? I don't know. Yes, please. That's fine. You guys are amazing. Except you, Benjamin. You're... <laughs> Why don't you crank out some guitar right now? That would really settle the mood. Um, this isn't even close to what my message is on, not even a little bit. But you look at Daniel, and you see a... Um, um, understand the time of what happened with Daniel. Israel had been prospering, okay? So you had, if you understand your history with, with Israel, which is important if you're going to read the Old Testament at all, because uh, otherwise it's going to be absolutely confusing. Um, one of the things that you'll find with, um, with Daniel is that, so, okay, let's go back. David and Saul are the first kings of Israel, okay? For, before that, it was just a group of judges, that was in charge of Israel. So there were each, each group, each tribe had their own leaders. Okay? This is where you get Samson and those stories from. He was a judge. Okay? Then you move into the monarchy. Now you have Saul becomes king. Not a good king, as you probably well know. And he wasn't a good king because he wasn't, it wasn't the right time for the monarchy. But the people insisted, and so God basically said, if, you, if, if that's what you want, here it is. Am I still hearing music? <laughs> I think it's angels because I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. No one mess with that. I'm gonna, just don't even tell me if it's not angels. I want to be convinced it's angels. <laughs> and then I can tell everyone in the future, okay? And whoever knows what's actually going on, if it's not, then you can come behind and correct it. And so... <laughs> Um, never mind. It was angels. They're mad. Okay. So, <laughs> so, um, and so you have, so we move into a monarchy. Now all of a sudden there's, there's kings. You have Saul, David, Solomon. Okay. Then everything, um, everything breaks apart. Solomon's sons, two of them get into a civil war and Israel splits. You have Northern Israel and Southern Israel, which is called Judah. Okay, northern Israel never has really a good king, and all of a sudden gets taken over by Assyria. Okay, so when you read these things in the Bible, this is what's happening. Assyria takes over northern Israel. Judah lasts about 100 years longer. Okay, but here's what happened with, um, with Judah, and this is what really resonated with me when Pastor was talking, is that in Judah, um, the king there, which I believe it was Jehoiakim, was the was the king during this time, and he uh, he wanted what he would have what we call itching ears. He wanted the prophets, which there were like 150 different prophets, to tell him only good news. Just tell me the good things, right? And so Babylon is getting ready to attack Israel. They're actually getting ready to take over the whole world. And Babylon, um, in their in their preparing, they're going to war with Egypt. They beat Egypt. We've talked about that before. Maybe one of you remembers that, but, <laughs> like, but I bet someone does. And so um, they, they fight Egypt. On their way back, they decide to attack Israel. Now, Jehoiakim is saying, we're good, right? These 100 and 150, whatever it is, prophets are telling him, we're fine. We have the Ark of the Covenant. Never mind the fact that God is saying that you will be taken over by Babylon. See, they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. And so because of that, they stayed oblivious. The king stayed oblivious and made a horrible decision because at the same time, you had Ezekiel and Jeremiah telling him, you need to allow Babylon to just take over. It will be better for you if you just submit to Babylon. But he wouldn't do it because he said, hey, we're, I'm king, and I can understand the temptation to, to, I mean, could you imagine being president and then all of a sudden two guys come to you and say, hey, by the way, you need to go ahead and let England just take over. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, well, I'm king and, you know, that, or president, whatever. And so Jehoiakim decides not to. Babylon, or Babylon takes over Israel. People are shocked. You know how you can tell that they're shocked? Because when the statue of Nebuchadnezzar goes up, in, in uh, Daniel 2, is it Daniel? No, Daniel 3, when the statue of Nebuchadnezzar goes up, there's only three people not bowing. 
You know why? Because the rest of them are offended. The rest of them are mad at God. Because, hey, he let us get into this, so I guess I'll bow to that God then. So at the ch- when things are changing, there's temptation to be offended. There's temptation to struggle. There's temptation to fight. Right? All of a sudden, everything that these people knew goes out the window. That's not how it's supposed to be. So what do we know at this time? Okay? I, I am going to get into some of my notes. I, have, I do not have enough time to go into all of them, which is good because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so the Lord took care of this. Oh, uh, Mona said to introduce myself. I'm Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, come back on Sunday, okay? It gets better. Pa- Pastor, you're preaching, right? <laughs> so, um, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You would never let me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, how many of you guys were here for Chip Brim? Yeah, that was amazing. Sunday night was awesome, too, if you guys were here for Sunday night. That was amazing. This is the second time I've had to follow Chip Brim, by the way. (laughs) So I want that to go on record, okay? Because you know if you have, like, you know if you have, like, two strong, like, uh, like, batters in baseball? You don't necessarily put them back to back, right? You put the pathetic little guy that can only bunt, (laughs) right? And then you have your good guy get up there, right? Just someone who can get a base hit, and then you bring up your good batter, right? (laughs) So (laughs) I'm I'm guessing you're preaching on Sunday, right? (laughs) So um, (laughs) I love you guys. We'll get a base hit tonight. Don't worry. All right. <laughs> Not the first time you called me that. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wasn't sure what we were doing. Um, can we go to Luke? I want to tell, I want to tell a story tonight. I want to talk about Jesus. But we're going to talk about him in a little bit of a different light. Uh, Luke 10, 38. This will be a very familiar passage for some. This is a story of Martha and Mary. But we're going to go into it a little differently than, uh, than maybe we always have, have seen this story. Um, because I think a lot of times we read this part of it. But what I love when I read the Bible is... is going into the story and really putting myself in the moment of those characters. And so I, I, it just comes alive to you. That's why I love history. Because when you, when you get to the point where you're like, I know exactly what they're thinking, how they're feeling, it changes everything. Because it's, you read these stories about people like George Washington and all these people, and it's like, I could never be that good. Well, you don't know what they were thinking the whole time. They didn't know they were George Washington. They didn't know they were John Adams. They knew that they, they were like, they didn't, half of them didn't think they would be remembered for anything. They were terrified that they would go down in history forgotten. And so um, that was really what, drew, what drove that group, that generation. And so when you get into the story of the person and you put yourself there and you understand what's the terrain like, what is, what's the geography like of the day, what is, I, mean, I want to be there. I want to know everything. I don't want to be like, like, I know those landmarks, right? Because when you do that, all of a sudden they become human, and now you see just how big God was in each situation. And he's still that big. It's, you hear that complaint all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, how come God doesn't do things like he did then? He what? Look at the country you live in. <laughs> look at what happened to form this country. I could tell you right now three straight-up miracles that happened during the revolution. Documented. You want documented miracles? They happen. They happen all the time. But you've got to understand that news is not um, incentivized to, to say that. Okay? If the news says a miracle happened and then they give, grace, uh, give glory to God then they're alienating a huge base of their followers. 
So what they do is out of fear of what that base is going to say, they water down the story and then we lose the miracle behind it. And so we're like, oh, that's cool, that happened. If you were really there, it wouldn't be just cool, okay? So you've got to realize, like, what is the motivation of what you're listening to? It's not just, it's not just, you, and that goes for any news, okay? And, and Fox or CNN, I don't care what you listen to, they're both motivated by one thing, right? And we know what that motivation is. And it's the same thing, that love for it is exactly what causes people to, what causes all corruption, right? It's, I don't want to lose my base because that's my bread and butter. So I don't need to, right? Who cares what the truth is, right? Okay, that was my high horse there, okay? I'm telling you, turn off the stinking news. Um, all right. Let's go ahead. Okay. Now it happened as they went. Now this is Jesus and his disciples. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick here. He entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Right? I love when Landon preaches on this. I just love it. Landon, Landon, he's one of my favorite people to listen to. And he's, when he gets up and he talks about this story, because I think this is probably one of your favorites, if not your favorite story in the Bible, it's a, it's true. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, it's up there, right? There, I'm, you're such a Christian. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> it's so, uh, anyways, so he, he talks about how it's a bad idea to, you know, tell Jesus what to do. And I think in this story, here's the thing, where we're a lot of times we're... we're were not happy with Martha in this story. But she wasn't doing anything wrong. She was just working, right? She's just working. And Mary was sitting at her feet, uh, at Jesus' feet. That makes us think about what we're doing as well. You know, I mean, that's not the point of what I'm getting to, but it does make you stop to think, what are we doing? Are we, are we working? That's not bad. It's not bad to work. She was working to prepare stuff to serve Jesus. I would imagine she's probably your type A person. I've got to be doing something, right? There's people in here. You're that type A person. I got to be doing something. I got to be doing something, right? But what if you're doing something is keeping you from resting and hearing something, right? If you're doing something stops you from hearing something, then you're really doing nothing. Does that make sense? Okay. So Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, so I want you to understand this is a relationship that's forming. From the best understanding we have, this is their first experience hanging out with Jesus, okay? There's a friendship forming, which we're going to find out when we go to the next verse. So let's go to John 11, because this relationship with Jesus, oh, I love this relationship with Jesus. See, we usually stop there and we're like, man, Martha just, she doesn't get it. Actually, Martha changed her ways. And we're going to find out, I mean, again, you got to put yourself there. So if you, if, if you will um, allow me, I'm, I'm just going to try to fill in some of the gaps. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. But based off what we're seeing some of these gaps, I think, are pretty accurate, okay? So Mary, I would imagine, is not your type A person, right? She's probably someone who's used to doing these things. Martha, the, these are sisters. Martha, is she, she probably does most of the work around the house, right? She's probably the one who's doing everything. So it can be frustrating in those situations. Now, it's great that Mary chose that way to listen. And in that moment, that was the absolute right thing to do. But I would imagine that Mary might get on people's nerves every once in a while, right? I mean, if you have a chore that needs to get done, you know, if you need to 
cut down a beehive, apparently. Like, you know, who knows whatever you're doing, right? It's always something. I feel like, like half of a man whenever pastor says anything. <laughs> like, I cut down a beehive. That one time, does everyone remember the time when he's setting up his uh, hunting stand and he was lifting like a telephone pole by himself? You remember that one? I'm like, what? <laughs> I could barely lift the box of tools that would bring me to the telephone pole. <laughs> but no, pastor's hoisting telephone poles over his shoulder. <laughs> so I love that man. <laughs> I'm so glad he's on my side. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go to uh, John 11. And this is Lazarus. Okay. So you have Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And Jesus is now close friends. I don't know what happened between these two stories. But I do know that all of a sudden, Jesus becomes very close with them. So I want to look at this story. And let's take a look at what happens with Martha all of a sudden. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. See, Mary... I mean, that's, that's amazing that she'd be willing to give that up, but I imagine Martha might have been annoyed about that one a little bit too, right? It's like, that was a lot of money, Mary. <laughs> um, so, and I worked for, anyways, all right, I'm done. Therefore, the sisters went to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Okay, we're seeing, a, here's this side of Jesus. We see Jesus as teacher. We see Jesus as king. We see him in these, in these lights. But let's look at, at him as friend. And, this, and let's put ourselves in this. I really want us to put ourselves in the perspective of Martha. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Probably not what you'd expect to flip the page to, right? I mean, if I find out that someone I love is sick, right? If I, if I find out, hey, they're, they're going to die. I'm probably not like, okay, I've got a couple more days left at this hotel, so I don't really want to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to finish out my stay because I paid for this, and then we'll head on over there, okay? Right? That's probably not the sense of urgency. And this is exactly why the church in today's world, this is so important. Jesus did not react. Okay? This is what reaction looks like. I'm talking to myself, okay? I'm talking to myself more than anyone, and I promise you, Abby can testify to this, okay? Someone posts something on Facebook. How many times have you typed the message, and you don't need to raise your hand. How many times have you wrote out a message and deleted it in the past six months? <laughs> I've got a lot, right? Right? <laughs> you did? That's impressive, man. You know your stuff. Okay. <laughs> you did? <laughs> okay. That's great. <laughs> it was political in nature, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, so, it's so easy to react. This is the difference between Jesus, right? Look at the woman caught in the act of adultery. He doesn't react. He calms down. He's got someone who is standing there naked in front of all these people, and they're getting ready to stone her, and he's like, he's taking his time. We need to take our time. We have to take our time. This is what the Lord has been talking to me about so much, and if, it, if he's talking to me and I'm part of this body, I gotta believe he's talking to other people in here too, right? Because you guys know me, right? You know how I feel about history. You know how I feel about all these kind of things, right? One of the things that happened for me in, this, in the beginning of this, this whole situation that came up was that I was like, okay, this is it. Like, I'm gonna be called into action. Like, this is it. Like, I am not the kind of person that's like, while the a major global situation or national situations going on, I'm like, come on, Lord, like, let's do this. Like, like, this is it. Times have shifted, like Pastor said. It's time. And you know what the Lord told me to do? Nothing. <laughs> I was like, Lord, what do I do, right? I'm sitting here looking up all these things. What can I do? What can I get involved with? How can I fight this? How can I be a part of it? And the Lord gives me nothing. 
I literally use the scripture where the person just keeps knocking and knocking and knocking. I'm like, Lord, I'm knocking every single day, right? I'm going to keep knocking. I never had an answer. And it drove me nuts because I'm like, I don't, how can I sit and do nothing through this? Because something would have been a reaction. Why did, that's what the Lord said. What changed? There's a pandemic. So? So what? Does that affect you? Are you a Christian? Are you healed? What changed? There's a pandemic in the world. That's, let, and, and within, with all love, I mean, understand, we are to love the world, minister to them, but let that, that's the world's deal. That's not our deal. You are from, are not from the earth. So that's not your problem. Now, it is our job to take authority over it. It is not our job to worry about it. It is not our job to change everything we're doing. And all of a sudden, now, and this is where I was, right? All of a sudden, it's like, I'm, I'm all focused on ministry. And I'm like, Lord, you've been, you know, all this stuff. And then it's like, all of a sudden, this, this situation happens, right? And it's like, hey, now I should shift. Why? Because that happened? That's not why you change something. What happens when there's, when there's a, a, a crisis that's going on where, you know, there's civil unrest? You do what the Lord says. It never changed. Nothing changed for us. And in fact, we should be lighter. If we are shifting our focus to accommodate what's going on in the world, why would the world want anything we have? What do we have to offer? The same solution? How is it working? Working well? Because the news seems really uplifting, right? Right? We've got to change. Like, we should continue even more, right? You've got situations going on, you know, whatever. Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Well, how about we just love everyone who walks through this door, and then people will say, Man, I just want to be there because regardless, I'm accepted there. That's where I'm loved. The church should be that, right? The church should be, hey, come on in. You realize that Jesus, Paul, Peter, all these guys, they were persecuted not because they decided to fight and, and take, take up arms and go ahead and, and we're going we're gonna to finish. No, because they loved people <laughs> and people didn't like that. You know why? Because that convicts people. Your love convicts others. Have you ever been in a situation where you're standing there with like two or three people and all of a sudden they start gossiping about someone and you won't, right? Or you say, hey, I really like them. All you're doing is showing love, but what's the response? Man, someone's holier than thou, right? Because love convicts. It's not your job to convict. It's, it's love's job to convict. The whole, God is love. The Holy Spirit and God are one. What is the Holy Spirit's job? To convict the world of sin, right? It's not our job to say, we don't stand there and say, hey, you're sinning right now. You know what that would get? Oh, you've never sinned before? <laughs> That's exactly what that would get. Let's try to finish this story. Can I finish this real quick? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, all right, so, Anyways, that was a long tangent, but basically, he's taking a different approach. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. <laughs> the disciples don't really, <laughs> they don't get this, okay? The next response is fantastic. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. <laughs> this had to be Peter, right? It had to be. <laughs> you just know it was Peter, <laughs> okay? They just stopped writing it at this point. They're like, they'll figure it out. All right. <laughs> Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> oh, man, I love Jesus. Uh, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Jesus is worried about a lot more than just one problem, right? 
this is how, this is one way you're going to know that the Lord is involved in something. If all you're solving is one problem, you're probably reacting, right? If what your solution does, so your car breaks down, and I'm guilty of this way too many times. Well, not my car breaking down all the time, but my attitude. So (laughs) car breaks down. Stupid car, I can't stand this car. It always breaks down, blah, 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 right? I'm going to get a tow truck. Good thing I have AAA, blah, 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 right? And then you finally get it fixed, right? Okay, your car got fixed. You solved one problem. What you could have done is while your family was watching, said, hey, we're going to stand together. We're going to believe the Lord for this. Watch the Lord do something. Now your car gets fixed, but people got ministered to. There's more to it than just one problem. Every problem brings with it a possibility to reach people. Everything. This is the difference between between Jesus and, and the disciples when we talk about what's going on in the world because they were consumed with purpose, consumed with reaching people, okay? And so everything they did was, we're gonna solve the problem, don't worry, we're gonna wake Lazarus up, but we're also going to minister. Something's gonna happen. All right. Um, and then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. They were not (laughs) happy with Jesus. Okay, this is, I want to get to this, and just give me like five more minutes, okay, guys? And then I will be done here. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Comfort them, right? This is our first reaction, right? They're sad. Let's comfort them. It helps sometimes with certain pe- when certain things are going on, but all they dealt with was the soul, right? Mind, will, and emotion. I want you to notice this as well. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Why not Mary? Wasn't Mary the one at his feet? But Martha's running to him now. What changed? What Jesus said resonated and she changed, Right? It, she had an encounter with Jesus. He lovingly said, hey, she chose the right way. Now we're seeing it flip. But I also want you to see what Jesus does because this is really powerful. So then Martha, or, or, um, but Mary was sitting in the house. I would imagine, and if I, again, we're going to piece something together here. I would imagine, you know, generally your, your type A people, this is not universal, but generally type A people are going to be a little bit more uh, project focused, right? They're not very emotional. They're usually a little bit more like, let's get the task done, right? But then the uh, type B, I guess, I don't know if that's the right term, but uh, <laughs> I would imagine, but those type of people are going to be a little bit more emotional. Now, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. That's just different, okay? So Mary, the last time she was with Jesus, she was sitting at his feet. He said, you did the right thing, and now Lazarus is dead, and Jesus took a few extra days to show up. This didn't sit well with Mary, right? Mary is still kind of distraught, I would imagine, because it doesn't seem like her to not come out, to not be the first one out. Remember, Mary's also the one who poured the fragrance on him after this. Um, now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Type A people are always honest. <laughs> it's good, though. That's a good thing. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, and you see the faith? Something changed in her since the last time. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whatever, uh, or whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He's dealing with her faith. He's focusing on her faith. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. Peter got huge accolades for figuring that out. You know how she figured it out? Because they were friends with Jesus. It went beyond, you're my teacher. It went to, I want to know you. 
This is the relationship he still wants with all of us. It goes beyond just, just, okay, that was cool. I read my scripture. No, get to know him. He's still alive. He wrote the book. He can talk, he can talk to you through it. When she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. I love how Jesus responds in this situation. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep. They don't understand, and that's fine. The world isn't always going to understand why we do what we do. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. It's an important place to be. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you hear the, like there's an emotion there. There isn't, like she is heartbroken because her brother died and she knows Jesus could have healed, healed him. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. I challenge you, if you're, if you're taking any notes, look up Psalms 18 and that's going to, I want you to see the correlation between the, the attitude that all of a sudden Jesus has and that God had for David in that situation. Uh, and so here's, here's his response. He's there, she's heartbroken, she's at his feet, and she's bawling. She's crying out to him. And now all of a sudden, Jesus turns into like beast mode here, right? He says, where have you laid him? So they said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. We love that verse, don't we? If you're reading a verse a day. <laughs> so that's a nice, easy day, isn't it? <laughs> All right. I'm trying to wrap up here, guys. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Why was Jesus weeping? He knew Lazarus was going to rise. He wasn't weeping because of him. He was weeping because of what Mary was going through. Right? He sees you. Whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever you're currently going through, right? You're in a tough situation. You might be in a tough marriage. You might be in a tough, you might have tough parents. You might have tough children, whatever. He sees that. Look at his response. And it causes him to move. But that's not the only thing that caused him to move. It wasn't just her weeping because she was weeping in the house. It was coming to his feet. You've got to come to him. He's the one who heals. And now we see what he does. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, now all of a sudden, I mean, he's... He's turned it on here. It's no more just talking. He's dealing with death, and he deals with it roughly, right? He, and we should. We don't mess with death. It shouldn't mess with us, actually. And he said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was, who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has was, been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? They took away the stone from the, from the place where he was de dead. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound. This is the God we serve. But Mary wouldn't have had that response, had that result, if she had not come to the feet of Jesus. She wasn't getting that result in the house. She was getting it at Jesus' feet. The same thing is going on in the world today. Some of you have had some horrible situations come up because of all the stuff going on. Go to the feet of Jesus. It hasn't changed. It never will. We can't forget the times the Lord has done something in our life. We can't forget that. Or our church. 
Have we forgotten Hartley? Have we forgotten that? Because I was here that day. Anyone else here that day? I watched the helicopter fly her away. That little, she's in class, I'm sure, right? <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> Has God not done something for us? This is the God we serve. Nothing changed. That should be the title of this message, okay? That's nothing changed. Nothing changed. There's civil unrest. Our country's talking civil war. There's a pandemic. Nothing changed for us. Okay, great. There's more people to minister to. At least everything's out in the open now. You can't really minister when people are having a facade, right? So if everyone's angry, hey, great. People are coming to the surface with the stuff that they're upset about. This is a great opportunity. Let's minister. People are terrified. Be not terrified, but be at Jesus' feet. Pastor, do you have anything you want to say? Okay. Um, thank you so much for giving me that extra time, guys. I appreciate it so much. Um, next time, let's not have me follow Chip Brim, and then, you know, you don't have to draw such a close comparison. Uh, <laughs> so give me some space, and then, um, anyways, I absolutely love you guys. Um, if you need prayer for anything, we're up here. So, I mean, uh, thank you so much for trusting me, you guys, up here with the pulpit. And so, uh, love you guys. Um, tell the, um, just tell the workers that Matt was preaching. <laughs> They'll know, okay? <laughs> love you guys. Have a great day. Oh, oh yes. Can you please help, uh, after you get your kids, help, will you please help turn the sanctuary over? Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>